Hi, welcome uh, back to E375. Uh, with this lecture, we're going to start uh, moving into a new uh, section of the course, uh, talking specifically about population growth, but more broadly, talking about this idea of dynamic models. So in the last uh, few units of the course, we've been working with models that kind of had the form of there's some, some response variable y that was being predicted as a function of some covariates x that could have been either continuous or discrete. Uh, this covered uh, our initial topic on linear models. We moved on to nonlinear models. We've in lab explored some mechanistic models. And all of those models, whether they were just a single straight line or something far more complicated, had this basic form of you put in some x's, you got out some y's. Uh, what we're going to do now is generalize that to a, a more broad class of models that includes specifically what we would call dynamic models. Uh, and when we have a dynamic model, we're interested in y at some point in time t, which we'll often use as y subscript t, uh, where that y is changing in time. It's a dynamic process. It's kind of what dynamic means. It's changing in time. Or it can change in uh, space and time simultaneously. Um, and these sorts of dynamic models are, are really common in the environmental sciences. And uh, because we're often trying to uh, predict something about the environment uh, and how that thing that we're interested in is changing, um, yeah, either in just in time or just or in time and space. So we're going to think about a more general form, y at some point in time in the future, t plus one, as a function of y right now and some covariates x. Uh, and so now we're we're not just thinking about uh, predicting y as a function of x, but y as a function y in the future as a function of y right now and some other x's. I should note that when we dive into dynamic models in time and dynamic spatial temporal models, uh, we can still fit these things the same way we've been talking about the last few weeks. We can still fit them by maximum likelihood. We can still estimate their parameter uncertainties through bootstrapping. We can still uh, put uncertainties in our predictions using Monte Carlo methods. Uh, but the iterative nature of these models affects uh, how we make predictions and affects how we understand what the model's doing. Basically, because more complicated, uh, but the, also the range of responses becomes much more rich. You know, a, a, if we have a model that just has an X and a Y with, with some straight line relationship, our, our, you know, our function always looks like a straight line. Um, with dynamic models, they can produce much more rich responses. So I wanted to give you a quick feel for why dynamic models are more challenging um, is kind of related to this iterative nature. So if I say that y at t plus 1 is a function of y right now, y of t, uh, if I want to know, what if I want to know y at t plus 2, two time steps in the future? Well, that's just going to be a function of y at t plus 1 plus the x's. But remember that y of t plus 1 was a function of y of t. And so now I have to take my function and plug in the original call of the function. This is what gives us what's called a recursive uh, you know, model, you know. So, so if we kept going back in time, we or if we keep going forward in time, we keep feeding ourselves back on ourselves. <clears throat> so, population models are going to be a great example of these sort of dynamic uh, models, and they're a simple class to start with, and they're also again a class that is is particularly important in environmental sciences. Uh, so just as kind of the text here says, population models are commonly used in the management of endangered species, invasive species, fisheries, contagious diseases, et cetera. Uh, they're used in basic science to understand populations, to understand how species interact, to understand how biodiversity is maintained. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with the simplest possible, most basic models, demonstrate the range of behaviors they're capable of and show that, you know, even with simple models, we can get uh, more complex behaviors, but then also kind of use that as a jumping off point 
So like what we did with linear models where we started with a simple univariate regression, then we moved on to multivariate, multiple regressions and you know interactions and polynomials and stuff like that. Um, with population models, we're gonna start with the simplest case and you know, actually a case very analogous to fitting the mean. Uh, and then we'll move on. And, and as we build up these more compli complex population models, everything we kind of talked about with simple model, with non-dynamic models also applies. I mean, if we wanted to add something to the model, we just take the model that we have right now and we could just augment it a little bit. So we always start simple. We always build up complexity incrementally. We stop adding complexity when it's no longer parsimonious. Cool. Okay. So before we dive into the math, let's think about some of the basic questions. You know, what, what are the hypotheses we're trying to test? What are the goals we're trying to reach with these models? And how we are using models to answer questions. Uh, and also to remember that, you know, while I'm going to spend a, a lot of the next few lectures focused on the model side of things, the process model side of things, that ultimately to be useful, these models are, are ultimately things that get fit to data um, and they get applied in, in real world contexts. So I'm gonna take a lot of the parameters for granted here, but in any real application, we'd have to estimate them. Okay, so how might we use, you know, what are the kind of the questions related to uh, endangered species or invasive species or, or harvested species or, or infectious disease? I'll give you a second to think about that. What are we trying to, to answer? So here are some example questions that are, are commonly, we commonly use models to try to understand. So for an endangered species, uh, we might wanna be, know if the species is in decline or not, and if so, how fast is it declining? We might also want to know just how many there are, but you don't necessarily need a model to answer that. It's more just basic sampling. Um, invasive species, is the species going to increase or not? Uh, will it spread spatially? So you have both a temporal question about change in time, but also a spatial question, spatial temporal question about spread. <clears throat> Harvested species, you know, how many individuals can be harvested without endangering the population. Uh, for diseases such as COVID and influenza, is the disease increasing or decreasing? Similarly to the invasive species, is it spreading uh, spatially? And for pretty much all of these questions, also we have the question of how will these population respond to different management options? The kind of unifying thing about these questions that we've raised is in all questions, they're questions about predictions. They're questions about uh, what the population is going to be doing in the future. So again, tying this to this idea of dynamic models, a lot of the questions we have about uh, you know, biological populations that we're trying to manage or even just monitor or understand is there are often questions about what they're going to do in the future. Oh, wait, going backwards, apologies. Okay, so quick thing before we dive too far, just start diving in. Uh, in population models, some notation. Uh, I'm gonna often use this capital N to indicate the size of a population. So instead of talking about X's, arbitrary X's and Y's, uh, the Y here is, is usually the population size N or the population density, if we're gonna express it on a per unit area basis. A lot of population models were originally formulated uh, in a differential equation context. Don't let that scare you because we're gonna very frequently convert that to just a simple difference equation. Uh, but often what we're thinking about, again, are questions about how they're changing in, a, in kind of a uh, calculus notion, notation how the population is changing is a question about the change in population dn with time dt. Um, the other thing that 
will be handy when thinking about uh, how we model populations is we often want to think not just about the population growth rate in absolute terms, but we often want to think about it in a per capita term. So DNDT divided by N. So, you know, for those of us, you know, uh, so, so, you know, you, you often see, if you look at, you know, population demographic information, you'll see, you know, population growth rates expressed on a per capita basis. So how many, uh, how many births, you know, per thousand people, how many deaths per thousand people. We see this a lot with infectious disease like COVID. You know, we often see numbers in terms of numbers of new infections per 10,000 people or 100,000 people, you know, so giving us some rate relative to the size of the population because that allows us to compare populations, uh, you know, that have different absolute sizes, you know, uh, in terms of, well, what's happening on a per person basis, because that really helps us kind of think about and conceptualize what's actually going on if we think about growth on a per individual basis.